All right, welcome to the Australian Lawn and Garden Podcast. This is going to be a very unique episode. I hope it is very helpful because we are going to go through exactly the things that I have done over the years as a small business with only a few employees. Some of these times I've been uh, with only one or maybe even only two employees. What I've done over the years to win large commercial contracts, we're talking fifty to $100,000 plus contracts uh, for gardening, lawn maintenance, all that sort of stuff. The exact method I've done to beat out the bigger competitors to get those results. It's just me talking today. It's also uh, 14 past eight as I'm speaking right now at night, which means lower your expectations for the production quality of this. Uh, the reality is as well that this is a very niche subject. So this is uh, this is a niche within a niche within a niche. This is this is not um, going to be uh, something that's going to rival Joe Rogan for viewership numbers at all, and that's okay because I think the value that's going to provide to the small businesses out there who are trying to upgrade their business, trying to grow. Some of you really want to get into this part of the industry, and and you are close. I remember exactly what it was like doing that. I rem- I seriously I remember being back there. I remember the first time I, I bid on a retirement village and I won it and it was 50 something thousand dollars a year and how big a deal that was back then. I think I was about 22 and it was awesome. And I just, I'm so proud of myself for that. And I had that contract for years and they're the sort of things that don't undervalue that. I don't undervalue that at all. And, and I would love for you guys to succeed. And I think my honest opinion is, I'd much rather small businesses who love those facilities and love the work they do to win those types of contracts than the big boys out there who just do it for the money, throw some employees out there on on basically minimum wage to get some profits at the end of the week. I think what you guys have to offer as small businesses can be very attractive to some of these facilities, not all, but what I'm going to show you is exactly what I've done in the past to get these results. You might go, why is he doing this? Well, I'm not making any money. This is not going to get Joe Rogan numbers. But the reality is is that I'm not really interested in doing large commercial work anymore. Uh, We can talk about it a little bit more later, maybe. And uh, I want some good people out there helping these large commercial places. And so let's reveal it out. Let's let's show exactly what we've done. I've got a document in here um, that I'm looking at right now. I haven't put it on the screen. Those who are listening, you may want to watch this on YouTube at some stage. Uh, obviously, you might be mowing a lawn while you're doing that. But I have a document here which is literally just copied and pasted from a bunch of our most recent bids that we've done over the last couple of years, showing you exactly the type of things we've written, exactly how we've quoted. Now, I've changed names and numbers and small details. You get the idea. I'm not going to reveal personal information about anybody, but you can see exactly what we do to quote. And exactly what we do to win these things. Hopefully, it's super, super valuable. One more thing before we get started. If you want to support the podcast in any way, uh, the best ways to do that, firstly, we've got a Patreon that we've just started. There's a link in there. You can support me uh, through that. I would greatly appreciate it. The second thing you can do is to share uh, the podcast. This episode might be so niche that you might not know anybody else who is actually interested in hearing it. So maybe go share a different episode that might be a bit more, have a broader audience. But that is the best way to support. We also have Instagram and Facebook. Uh, so jump on there, get involved, commenting. I do my best to reply to everybody for YouTube comments, things like that. So support in that way, help with the algorithm and Patreon will make a big difference. Help me out with this time. Now, let's get into the podcast. All right, before we get into the how you actually quote, the first question you've got to answer is, do you really want this type of work? Because I have a bunch of stories I can tell you about how difficult some of this commercial stuff really is in the real world. It might turn you off the idea, but maybe it won't because it's just each different type of business is, is specific. There might be things that you're interested in. There might be things that you like handling and dealing with that you don't mind. Other people would hate. But there are some downsides. A lot of people get sucked in for the vanity numbers. They think a $50,000 contract, that would be amazing. And 
you know, they, they run through what they could do with that and just being at one site and not having to send out 50 reminders to clients and, you know, not have to, you know, like it's simple and I want to sit in a lawnmower rather than walk behind a lawnmower. There's a lot of things that are attractive, but there are a few things that you got to watch out for. Let me tell you some stories from my experiences over the years. Many years ago, some of these businesses I'll name and shame and some of them I won't because uh, you'll see. But many, many years ago, I uh, was quoted, I was doing a quote. For those in WA, you will know that in Bad Ivers, on the freeway, there are these two twin roadhouses, BP roadhouses. They are, and at the time were, they still are, the biggest roadhouses in WA in terms of size, volume of cars coming through. It was a big deal. We got asked to quote this contract. Let me condense this story for you. My original quote to maintain both of them um, without mulching uh, was, I believe, $56,000 a year. This is maybe 2016, 2015, something like that. It was a long time ago. Anyways, um, they came back and they were like, hey, you guys, we like how you do business. I'll show you what I did to make them think that we were good later. But they're like, oh, we like the way that you're quoting. We're like, how you talk. You seem like a good business to work for. Um, problem is that it's a bit expensive for us. What if we got rid of some of the frequency of services and a couple of services here and there so they weren't haggling on our hourly rate, they weren't haggling on how much we charge per service. What if we bring down a few of these things to reduce our costs? What can we do? Now, BP, I should be very clear, were not the ones we were dealing with. We were actually dealing with a massive international cleaning and facility management company. Now, they had won the contract for both the gardening and the cleaning, and they wanted to subcontract the gardening, right? A lot of times, that's not going to be a problem. If This ended up being a major problem later on. You'll hear in the story. And so, you know, they said to us, oh, can you reduce some of the services? And I was like, no worries. We'll reduce some of the services. Because, you know, they, the request wasn't that big. You know, they're maybe talking about reducing 10, 15%. So we did that. And obviously, 10, 15% of the services were reduced. Anyway, so they come back to us and they do it again. And they do it again. And then they do it again. And after three or four times, I was like, I don't even want this job anymore. Like, this is not very attractive. And the entire quote had been cut down from 56000 to twelve thousand dollars a year for both sites, six thousand dollars a year per site for the biggest facilities in the country. Here's some more contract uh, context. They, I was told later on, not during the quoting process, but by a BP employee, if I remember correctly, I think the manager of one of the sites, that seven thousand people a day were going through this. Right, so it was like two days of $1 per person was enough money to pay for this entire guardian contract. So it was, look, it got like that over time. But the idea was that they said, oh, we'll make the contract $12,000. And he goes, as you need work, just tell us. And um, we'll accept the stuff that's necessary. We did the job. Uh, after three months, one of our services was reticulation maintenance. And there was a bunch of broken sprinklers that had been driven over because people drive over all the curbing at this very busy facility. They didn't accept the quote. Three months later, we sent them another quote, uh, which was around $10,000 to replace 400 dead plants and to fix the sprinklers. And uh, we had a crisis meeting about a month after that where BP were going to sack the cleaning company because this facility was dead. It was looking horrible. I'm condensing the story. You get the idea. It hadn't had water properly for months and months and months. We kept rocking up. It made our reputation look horrible because all these people were driving past. We're the gardeners. And look, this place looks like shocking. But no one was accepting our quotes. Big multinational company. You get the idea. It's what turned out looking attractive was now horrible. Over a longer period of time, um, you know, we had these meetings and I found out that this cleaning company, they had quoted the gardening maintenance before they had talked to a single gardening business. And what had happened was they had only quoted $22,000 a year to maintain both sites. So when we came in at $56,000 a year, we were way too expensive. They were hoping to make some money off it. They realized they underquoted. 
we ended up giving them an I don't want to do it price because you clearly don't know what you're doing and it is hurting our reputation. In essence, we sacked them, right? We were like, it was, I think we went to $70,000 a year or something like that because we, ha- we also had to actually include mulching. So the 56000 originally wasn't even good enough. So those sorts of stories, I have many of those types of stories from 10 years in business. But that can be the case where you can get these really attractive looking commercial jobs and it's just not the case. Other common things that happen in the industry are things like working for a committee. (sighs) That's tough. Sometimes it is a real challenge when you work for these committees and the reason is that these committees can often be, how would you put it, undecided. They're not in agreement. You have 10 people on a committee, six of them agree on one thing, four of them agree on the other and so they because it's six to four, they head in one direction and they hire you. The four wanted a different business, right? But because of a couple of votes, they got you, which means those four people don't like you the whole time you're there. It can be a real difficult thing. Uh, we, we had a site, I don't know if I said this before, but we had a site which was 100, 196 houses, right? Six-figure plus contract, right? Took so many people, you know, and so much hedging. Each house probably had average of two to four hedges per house plus common areas. It's probably a thousand hedges in this facility, right? There were 700 roses in the facility. I know that, right? We ended up pruning 300 of them in a week or something like that, like a huge place. You can think about the numbers involved. The problem is how, how do you make 196 different people with different temperaments and and goals and budgets how do you make them all happy you just can't right and those sorts of contracts are very difficult to deal with so you've got to decide whether or not this is the right industry for you ultimately these are some of the things to some of the reasons why we've actually pulled out of doing commercial work it can definitely be done successfully but what we found in our business is that we just enjoy small residential jobs and we make more money off them like that's the honest truth but that's just us and maybe uh, you can go about it and you're smarter than me and I mean that I'm not being sarcastic maybe you're you're just you fit in that niche a lot better than what we do and the way that commercial stuff works is just right up your alley but maybe actually doing the work you're fantastic at and the quoting side of it you're not so great at which is what this is going to be about so that's the first thing decide whether or not it's for you or not um, I've got lots of horror stories. I'm sure you'll hear them over the years of listening to this podcast. Okay, the next question that people often have is they say, how do you even get an opportunity to quote these sorts of places? I've been in business five years and no one's ever asked. I've been in business 10 years and no one's ever asked. Go back and listen to the podcast I did with Darren um, Gallagher and um, Gallagher, I should say. I slurred them, my words there. But so uh, it's called How to Get $100 an Hour Clients. It's something like that. Um, go back and have a look. Because the marketing principles we use in that are the same sort of marketing principles that get you these kinds of jobs. A lot of people pride themselves on having word of mouth be how they get their work. Massive problem with that. Um, we say this in the podcast, but I'll repeat it here. Word of mouth is underrated and overrated. It's fantastic if it's delivering the type of clients you want. But the problem with word of mouth is, let's say you're doing a lot of residential work. Well, those residential people, right, well, they're friends. So you're doing work for, um, let's say, dentists and school teachers and accountants. Well, they're probably not the people who are making decisions. They're not facility managers right? And so you need facility managers and it's very rare. I've only had one person I know of in our entire business history and we've served over 4,000 different clients over the years. I know that like, and like we have a database of every client we've ever served. It's more than 4,000 people. And I'm only aware of one where we were doing their property and they uh, were the manager of a a specific site of an international company 
and they needed some work. And we did that for about a year or so and ended up moving out of that area. It's about half an hour away from where he lived. And that was only like a 18, 15, 18, maybe $20,000 a year job, right? One, word of mouth is very difficult to transition from a certain type of client to the other because people hang out with similar people to them. So if you get into the facility manager crowds and you're doing fantastic work, then you can get great, great word of mouth. So you need to put yourself in front of these businesses in a different way. There's three ways to do that. The first is Google, which is the one that we primarily use. So SEO, which is organic search. And the second is uh, Google ads on Google. So within the same category, um, that takes a long time. And we don't target that type of work. So we don't really, how would you put it? Um, because we don't tra- target that type of work, we're not, yeah, we're not going to get huge amounts of, of requests coming through. We get maybe one to three big facilities, sort of $50,000 a year plus facility requests a year. I think we've had two so far this year. So maybe we get more, right? But a lot of them we just talk to and, and like, because we're not trying to get that type of work. We, after a conversation or so, if they're not a perfect fit, we're not trying to trying to win them, right? So you could probably get more out of Google, but I'm just setting your expectations. We're ranking for a lot of different pages in a lot of different areas. And so you're not going to get a whole lot of them from Google. Once you get your foot in the door though, you do get facility managers talking and they, you know, you know, you know how it works, right? It's word of mouth. So Google's one option. The second one, which I think is really quite elegant, is LinkedIn. Use there's a whole strategy behind this which I can't get into because of time. But the, the basic idea is you can use it as like a cold, cold, cold calling um, sort of strategy where uh, you can pay for uh, LinkedIn. I think it's called LinkedIn Premium. It's it's money. It costs money like $90 a month or something like that. But you get access to sending people messages and, and you can just look up facility managers. Literally try and find... Use Google Maps to find the facilities you want to look at. So let's say there's a private school in your area. If you are, you know, don't go for a private school if you've never done any large commercial work. You're just wasting your time, right? Like that's the sort of the higher end, top of the tree sort of stuff, right? But let's say um, you're looking for some strata managers. You just want to get your foot in the door. Just look up strata managers on LinkedIn and send them some messages and say, hey, we're a gardening business. Are you looking for people? Right, I, and do you know what? They probably are. Some of them probably are. They might not be the best work, those strata jobs to start off with, but it can be a really great way to get that. And so you can do that and use that LinkedIn. I would pay for the premium if you're trying to get this sort of stuff. $90 a month over the course of the year. Yeah, it's like $1,000, right? But if you're serious about this and you're going to be consistently messaging, I'm not just like saying send three messages and keep it on I'm saying, I'm saying be really deliberate, be really active. Every night, come back, send more messages, be persistent, send some someone another message six months later if they rejected you the first time, right? Just just do it. You'll find as well with a lot of these contracts, um, timing is really important, so you've got to be consistent. So like they might have a contract, let's say they're unhappy with their current provider, but they're six months in, you send them a message, they just blank you. It's not because they hate you. There's just there's nothing they can do. They've got six months left in the contract. Why would they reply? You send them another message four months later. Okay, interesting. Maybe they'll hit you up and they say, hey, look, we'll, we'll message you in a month. Give us a quote. That sort of stuff, right? And the last one is old school. Literally just rock up to the place and send them, you know, give them a, give them a card, give them a nice little brochure. You can be really fancy or really simple with how you do it. I've seen some people, uh, I've heard of one one commercial company who got a custom chocolate bar made. They would, um, like, um, this is, it costs money to do this too, right? But this is a property management business, not a gardening business. A friend of mine was running this business. They had it be somewhat successful where they would go to strata managers and places like that, got people's names off the internet, probably LinkedIn or, you know, just the websites. And they say, let's say this lady's name's Michelle, for example, this shit's a property manager. They would get a custom chocolate bar made and get someone to write um, a, like a little letter on it in like white chocolate on the on the dark chocolate or the milk chocolate. 
bar, which would sort of say, dear Michelle, you know, we do these type, you know, think of us next time you need these services, like something short, like a single sentence. Um, enjoy the chocolate from business name, blah, blah, business card in there. People remember that sort of stuff, right? A great way you could do it as well is you see all these beautiful, um, if you guys are watching on YouTube, or if you've seen the, the podcast before, you know I've got a green wall behind me of plants. You can go to a local nursery, right? Get a, say, a ZZ plant. I'll grab one up here to show you. This here is a ZZ plant, okay? Um, the actual name, I'll read it out to you because I don't know, but it's Zamioculacus. Or Colchis. So, Zamiocalcus. <sighs> My Latin's not fantastic, is it? Anyway, these ZZ plants, fantastic. Really hard to kill. Cast iron plants as well. I can't remember exactly what this cost me. I got this from Banara Nurseries. So, wholesale prices, $8. You know, you could get a little plastic pot for this from Bunnings, $10, whatever. Something that looks nice. Pot it up. And anyone who works in the office will want this, right? $10. For the plant, ten dollars for a pot or whatever it was, you know, twenty twenty five dollars. You're going to have something. If you have ten, twenty facility managers, yeah, it's going to be two hundred to four hundred dollars. But you have a little card in there, you know, write your business name, all that sort of stuff. This sort of stuff will set you apart from other people, and it's going to be left on their desk for forever, <laughs> right? Because every office manager, every facility manager loves this kind of stuff. So you can go down that path. Oh, whoopsies. I've knocked my TV. Whoopsie daisy. I'll put in my plant down. I knocked my cable that connects to my TV. Again, I told you to lower your expectations <laughs> with this podcast, didn't I? But look, you, the information is good, right? <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> um, hopefully the information compensates for the lack of technical ability. But um, those sorts of ideas, um, yeah, little plants, things like that, it's just – this is how you compete and this is the start of how you compete against the big boys in the ways that they don't care. If someone cares enough to make you a little chocolate like that, if someone cares enough to get you a little plot plant, what does that say about that type of business? It says they, if they care that much about those one percenters, then they really care about their job, right? So there are three ways that you can go about this. Let me reiterate. Google, Google is not going to set the world on fire. If you don't have any work coming in, you may twiddle your thumbs for years and not really get anything, right? Especially if you're not quite in the areas where there's a lot of commercial work going around or if your website is not as convincing. Ours is, you know, better than most. So we do get those sorts of requests. But like I said, not many a year when you're talking about big contracts. The second thing is using LinkedIn and, you know, we talked about that in more detail, but you can use that as more of a cold calling uh, way of reaching people just through messaging on LinkedIn. The last one is to physically go in. I would honestly, if you were committed to getting the commercial stuff, you can do all three. Now, there's a fourth one called tendering. We are not going to talk about tendering at all in this podcast. However, in the future, I've already organized this. We have somebody who's very experienced with tenders winning massive government tenders. That's their world. I've only ever bid on two tenders before and I didn't win either. So I'm not going to tell you what to do with tenders. I was never really interested in them. They were ones that, um, well, one I tried out and one I was asked to be a part of. So I said, why not? But other than that, um, that's not my world. So tenders as well, it's a whole different ball game. The sweet spot that we're looking for here is roughly twelve, fifteen thousand dollars a year contracts to about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year contracts. Those are the ones that usually don't. Some of them will, but a lot of them won't go out to tender. And those companies, that's where your smaller businesses, like the people listening to this, can get um, uh, an opportunity. So back to how you get in the foot in the door. You can do it through Google. You can do it through um, LinkedIn and in-person stuff and I would do all three if you were serious about this and that's really the angle you want to go down go all three you may only have 20 or 30 facilities that you really want in your entire service area right so the more consistent like it's not that much work like you think about 
retirement villages. How many retirement villages are actually in your service area? How many private schools are actually in your service area? How many strata complexes? There won't be that many, right, if you're serving a small area. And so you can outdo the big boys through consistency, being available, being helpful, all that sort of stuff. If anybody ever applies, you know, but there's a way to get into that market there. Right. Now, let's get into how to quote this stuff. All right. So now let's say, hypothetically, you've got your foot in the door. Someone's asked you, can you come to site? We would like you to quote our facility. Let's talk about your mindset. You say, yes, you're going to go there. There are two things you must not do before you get in there. The first thing is you cannot compete with the big guys on the things that they are good at. You've got to take that out of your head. The two things that they are going to beat you on every single time is experience right, and price. Now, you might be surprised at the price, but let's talk about experience to start with. If you have 10 employees, and so let's say, so the business you're up against has 10 employees, and you have zero, you're solo. It doesn't matter if you've got 25 years experience in the industry. They've got 10 people. Combined, they might have four or five people who've got four years, and a few that have got five years, and all of a sudden, they've got 50, 60 years combined experience, Right? It just, you guys know this intuitively. A company that's got 200 employees, they're going to have all sorts of experience with larger facilities that they can point to, all sorts of references, things like that. If you go online, you see a lot of the stuff, and I know there's not a lot about that out there, but if you were just to copy the way that they wrote their quotes and just go, here's our experience, here's our team, Right, you got to write that sort of stuff. We're going to show that later. But if that's all you could do, you're going to lose because someone's going to have a better team than you. Someone's going to have better experience. Second thing is price. Believe it or not, these big guys are very cheap, and they're not cheap in that they're losing money. They know their accounts. They've got a whole accounting department if they've got you know a big business. The reason why they're cheap is because of economies of scale. You know this. A small hamburger shop is not going to be able to compete on price with McDonald's. And yet, a lot of us as small businesses, we feel like we should be able to compete on price. Get that out of your head. Do not try and compete on experience and do not try and compete on price. If you are going to quote these places, you need to go in there knowing that you're going to likely be more expensive. Start with that as your mindset. If that scares you... There's nothing I can do about that. Some of you guys and girls, you're listening to this and you know that your trailer setup, the way your youth is presented, the way you dress, you're going to rock up and they're not going to take you seriously. So if you do want to go down this path of being professional, getting these big quotes, before you get on site, you need to win on these one percenters. And so don't just go, well, I'm going to compensate for that with being cheap or I'm going to compensate for that with telling them about all my experience because I've got all this. You just won't win it on that. You have to win on the one percenters. If your ute is rusty, you don't have nice signage on your trailer, your equipment's all old and you rock up to a nice big commercial facility, I think you know. I think you know in your heart you're not going to win that sort of job. You have to commit on the one percenters. So let's talk about the one percenters. Okay, so here are four ways that you can set yourself apart from uh, the big boys to make yourself look really attractive. These are the one percenters that win you these kind of jobs. Put yourself in the shoes of a facility manager. They've dealt with all the big boys before, right? A lot of facility managers, it's not their first time being a facility manager, especially at a big place. They've dealt with all sorts of people at the smaller places they worked at. They've worked their way up. They've dealt with a lot of gardening businesses, right? They can see through your rubbish if you're going to lie. They can see through your little games. These have to be serious. But 
if they are serious and you get these four right, I believe you will have a chance of winning this contract. It's not going to work every time. Like I say, an anchor man, 60% of the the time, it works every time. I don't know how often it's going to work. But this is going to give you a real chance. And if you're serious about this, you'll take these seriously. Here are the four things. The four advantages you have over the big guys. The first is the importance of the contract to your business. In other words, a fifty dollars to $100,000 contract for a solo operator or a two-man team would often make that the biggest client for that business, which means they are number one priority. Don't downplay the importance of that because a $50,000 to $100,000 contract or even a $150,000 contract to a, to a business with 200 employees, who cares? Right, they don't care that much about that sort of stuff. When I was a head groundskeeper at some public schools, they redid the contract. I uh, did it every few years for the lawn mowing at the school. Now, <clears throat> the school was in a catchment area, public school, of eighty-four other schools. I got a letter as a head groundskeeper saying a certain business had been chosen because it was had nothing to do with me. It was government, and that the contract was nine million dollars a year to do the 84 schools. I was like, $9 million a year. That's what these sort of companies, that's what they're looking for. Fifty to $100,000 a year. Yeah, I mean, if they win it, they win it. Fantastic, you know, no worries. But it's not make or break like it is for you. Facility managers know this. If there is a facility manager out there who is sick of dealing with the big boys and they see a small operator who they think has some potential that's one of the best ways you can put yourself ahead of them. Just be honest and say, if we win this, you'll be my second biggest. You'll be my biggest. You'll be one of the biggest clients I've got. Whatever, be honest. And so that's really important to us. And because of that, we're going to prioritize you. That's the first thing, the importance and priority that you can deliver. The second thing is the care factor. A lot of you guys and girls listening to this, you're, you undervalue how valuable you are that's a simple way of saying it how how about a better word that i think you get what i mean has someone who's employed i don't know how many people worked for me over the years maybe 30 40 something like that and i've managed other people in different businesses maybe more i don't know anyways when i talk to small business owners even the guys out there who are somewhat cowboys they in some ways just annihilate the field when it comes to the type of people who I talk to for jobs. And I see this. I don't know. If I've interviewed, I probably have interviewed four, three to five people in person for every job I've hired. Sometimes I've interviewed seven or eight and haven't hired. I've probably had 60 applications for every person I hire. You do the numbers, right? If I've had 40 or 50 people now, I think of it, work for me over 10 years, times it's hundreds of people who have applied so i've seen what the market is like and some small business owners are just magnitudes better than the options out there and people like me business owners are really good at dressing up how good our team is but we sort of know that there's sort of two even you've got a business of 5 10 15 people you know you've got three or four studs stars and you've got five or six people who are you know glorified laborers and um, you know, I can say that now because we, we've downsized our business. So, <laughs> so I'm not throwing anyone under the bus, by the way, who works with me anymore. Everyone who works with me now is a stud. But um, facility managers know this too, right? They've dealt with the people. They'll have the, the quoting guy, the business owner come, you know, the person like me with 10 employees or when, you know, back in the day, they'll come and quote. And then they know that that person is not going to be the person doing the job. It'll be the duds, right? It'll be... You know, especially with a big business paying 20 something bucks an hour, right? So the first thing is the importance that that big contract is to you. The second thing is if you're the person on site, that is hugely valuable. And small businesses underestimate this because they think that a facility manager wants a big business with 30 employees, 100 employees, whatever it is. Some of them do. That's true. Some of them are sick of that. And they would love nothing more than the small business owner taking responsibility even if they're not on site every single day right the private school that we do at the moment the one contract that we have if a problem happens i am there as soon as possible right 
I like the people at this school. They're really great people to work for, right? It's a nice contract. I enjoy doing the work. I want it to look good, right? If I have a problem today, I've had a problem with some um, technical side of the job and I called up literally a manufacturer of a product who I have access to. And I was like, hey, what's going on here? The results are not what I'm expecting. Is it because of the weather? Is it because of this? The school didn't really care that much, but I cared because they're one of my priorities. And people know that. So you might go in there feeling like, mm, I'm a small guy. Who would want me? That actually may be your power. That may be to your benefit. So because it's a small, small, you're a small person, a, a $50,000, $100,000 contract, that's huge. They know that. They know that having the business owner on site or available a lot, that's hugely valuable. The third thing that you can give which big businesses can't give, and even medium size, and by medium size, I'm talking 10 people, right? Which is, um, excuse me, just burp off the microphone. Uh, uh, 10 people would be a small business in reality, but the third thing you can offer as a solo or one or two people small business is you can have this flexibility with specific requests. So again, we talk about um, retirement villages, right? Old people, they might be specific with when they want the job done. They might say, we don't want it done between these certain times because that's when we play our lawn bowls. Okay, for you as a small business, yeah, that's your biggest job. You'll reschedule everybody else around it. And let's say they really want the work done on Tuesdays and your Tuesdays are free, but your Fridays are empty. You won't say, oh, screw them. I can only do it on Friday. You'll probably move all your Tuesdays to Fridays and those residential jobs won't care so much, right? Whereas a big contract... Same thing, right? Big business, all these employees, they're not flexible, right? You can use that to your advantage. And the last thing is being professional and being very specific with how you quote and how you talk to the clients. I'm going to talk very specifically through that. I'm going to show you the document. But how these big businesses do it is they usually have like a, a form, a formula that they throw out. So basically, here's our quoting form, nice and quick, get it out. They're quite general with the quote. They'll say, oh, how often do you want the most lawns mowed and lots of stuff? But because they're not a priority, they don't ask the 1% of questions. And you have a massive opportunity, and I think this is the most powerful thing here. You can bind those, those three things I talked about, importance to your business, the care factor you give as a business owner, the flexibility you can give, and then you put them in the document that I'm about to show you, you've got a great chance of winning these types of contracts. All right, and here we are. Uh, I have put the document on the screen. This is literally the front cover of what we send to clients. Now, if you're watching this on your phone, this is going to be very small, so I'm going to zoom in. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. Let me just show you how, what our layout looks like. Um, for those listening, you may want to... Uh, Pause, pause the uh, podcast. Maybe, maybe you listen to this all the way through on Spotify, but then you come back and you pause it. And maybe when you finished your work job or when you are quoting these types of facilities, you can come back and look at this form. I was thinking about putting out a form you could download, but I realized that no, these are not hard to make, really. And and there will be downloadable forms already online. It's not specifically about what it looks like. It's just that. It needs to look like you've put some effort and put some professionalism into it. I use Canva for a lot of the stuff. If you guys haven't heard of Canva, started by somebody in WA, believe it or not, a Perth lady. Anyways, um, but it's a great it's a great tool for, to make things look pretty. Um, so hopefully you've got a nice logo and you've got some nice photos. One of the things I would say is. Just like we talked about these these little one percenters with the plants and things like that we talked about before, delivering to the strata managers, whoever, those little things go a long way. Professional photos go a long way. Do not use stock photography, especially of American stuff. Do not use photos of somebody else's work, right? If you do not have good photos, Go and get some good photos, right? Even if you just have a friend who's really good at Instagram pics, right? And you're just like, hey, can you just take some photos of me on your phone? I'll buy you a Zinger box, right? Like you might not have the budget. 
If you look at these pictures here, I'll zoom in on this. Here we go. Look. Look at how young I used to look. <laughs> this is when I was young and fit and had potential. Now it's all gone. Now that photo there, um, that was from a photo shoot, as you can tell, quite a few years ago. I paid a local photographer $250 for that shoot. I'll be honest with you. It wasn't – not many photos <laughs> came from that $250 shoot. That one did, though. That's still on my website. I still use that photo all the time. There's about four or five photos from that shoot that I might still use. I probably got 40 from it, 50 from it, right? So obviously 250 bucks is a cheap photographer. The other ones that you're seeing is from a business called Muller Mind, based in Geraldton, four hours north of Perth. A friend of mine runs that. He is fantastic. If you go on the Silverstone Gardening website, or our Instagram or anything, and you see some of the more professional shots. That's Michael at Mullermind. He is amazing. He would cost $2,000 a day, right, plus editing and stuff like that. And um, actually, I don't know exactly what he costs because a lot of these shots are actually from videos, so they're screen grabs from videos, and the videoing stuff is, yeah, but you're looking at a lot of money. Now, you might say, well, I don't have that sort of money. That's fine. But if you're really serious about this and you do have the money, honestly, the photos, they're worth it. Go get a hire a photographer, a local person, even a teenager. Honestly, like a teenager with a DSLR and a good eye, it's going to be way better than any iPhone stuff that you've got. And it, it will set you apart and it will be worth it. So as you can see, we have the setup, beautiful photos. The layout is important. Um, not in the sense of like literally, you know, if it's a millimeter off, they're not going to care that, you know, about you. If you get it perfect, that you win millions of dollars. It's not like that, but just having a nice, clean layout. And usually what I say is lawn maintenance quote. So it would be, let's say somebody is saying they want, you know, they, their lawns maintained. That's what you'd write. If it was grounds, you know, it's grounds maintenance. If it's garden bed maintenance, it's hedging. You write what, what you're quoting here. If it's a proposal, you say proposal instead of a quote. And then, you know, the property name. So let's say law maintenance quote for KFC in Western Sydney, you know, and here's the date, right? Your logo's at the top. You get the idea. Sets it out. This opening page, just with those photos like that, um, I'll zoom out so you can see a little bit better. You get the idea. You can see that this is a business what this is telling you is we do high quality work. We have uh, lots of people in our team, lots of different people on our team. And yeah, it sells, it sells a story. If you're solo, you know, you might go, well, I don't have lots of people on my team. Don't worry about it. Like I said, that might be hugely valuable for some people. Just do lots of photos of you doing different stuff. And it shows, hey, you can do hedging. You can do mowing. You have some nice gear. You, you know, have a drone shot. Fantastic. You know, that sort of stuff. Then this next bit as well, super important. I write a tiny little letter to every single one at the introduction. When you have, now these quotes, you would have had a meeting with the facility manager before you write the quote. Usually you go there, it might be with other businesses around. They're always awkward, um, but usually it's not. Usually it's just you and them go there Ask a lot of really specific questions. If you are listening to this, you might want to stop and write down some of these questions because these are the make and break one percenters. Then when you get the questions, I'll tell you these questions in a second and, and you need to think of ones yourself, right? Like, but I'll give you some ideas. Write, you have a perfect opportunity to, to write what you're trying to achieve and some of the, just to show you are listening in a little introduction letter, signature it, right, where I've written signature. And I've written my name, Luke Smith, business owner, but obviously you get the idea. But here are the type of questions that you ask, hugely valuable questions. The first thing, great question is, why are you talking to us right now? You know, so obviously you've had a business before, you haven't liked them. What has caused you to be interested in, firstly, a new contractor? And why were you interested in us? 
both those contracts, uh, both those questions super powerful because they will tell you the problems with the previous contractor, right? And they'll reveal to you what they like about you. So they might say, well, the last guy, um, to be honest, he's, he's worked really good, but he's super inconsistent. He's super unreliable. And you know, it's really grinding our gears and we want someone who's more reliable. And the reason why we're talking to you is I went on your Google reviews and the reviews sort of showed that you seem like you were sort of organized and good at running business. Write those notes down because what they just told you, if that's their answer, they don't really care about the quality of the gardens. They care about the quality of your organization. Are you going to rock up on time? Right? All that sort of stuff. Write those things down because if you then write your whole document about how you're going to make the gardens look fantastic, they don't care so much, right? Because the other guy was good at that, but he's disorganized. You might find another thing. They might say something like, the other guy, he's he just rushes. He's so fast. And we got a lot of old people and they don't really feel safe leaving their room when the lawnmower is rushing around with the zero turn that's flying around, things like that. Write those things down. These one percenters, this is where you win these sorts of contracts because now you have a perfect opportunity to write them into your document to show you are listening, to show you care, and to put yourself in a completely different bracket. Right? The rest of these businesses are not doing this. They might have some of those questions, but they're just going to be vague. So here's what I've written for those listening uh, in my opening letter. And this is just a couple of paragraphs. It's short. It shouldn't be long. Not yet, at least. And I've just said, let me take a sip of water before I read this. Dear blank, let's call her Sally. Dear Sally, thank you for the opportunity to present this quote. I enjoyed our meeting on Monday. I just said Monday because, you yeah, know, whatever. But, you, you know, I've enjoyed our meeting. After listening to your needs, I feel that we're a good fit for your site. I hope it, um, and my hope is that we can come to an arrangement that's a great deal for both parties. Right. And so you see how I've said I've, uh, I've been a bit vague there, but you can be a little bit more specific and put things in like, uh, I've listened to your needs specifically about blank, 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 and I feel like we're a good fit for your business. Right. Next part I've written. In this document, I'll give a brief overview of our prices, explain in detail every service we are quoting. That is a huge thing. Don't undermine the power of that. Um, in detail, every service we're quoting, so that uh, I've written so that twice. And let me read it again. Explain in detail every service we're quoting for so that you know exactly what you are getting from our services. Present some recommendations and introduce our team that will be responsible for the work at your property. Full quotes and costings are at the end of this document. There's a lot of information in this quote. So if you have any questions at all, then please don't hesitate to ask. Signed. Okay. Open up the door. You know, this is what this is about. Now, this is where you do your knockout blows. If I go down, well, actually, no, we're not quite there yet. I lied. Sorry. Quick things, our team. So on the same page, we've got photos of the team, each individual member, and some details about them. So let's say if it was me and I was, I was saying, I'm going to look after the site, I would tell about how long I've been in the industry, what sort of experiences I have, especially ones relevant to the site. If you have any experience at all working on a larger site, so for example, let's say you've worked at a nursery, a big nursery, right? That counts because you, let's say, you know, to, if all you've done is residential work for your business, but before you did that, you worked at a nursery, even though it's not a retirement village, and let's say you were quoting a retirement village or it's not a school, it's not, you know, whatever. It still shows that you've got a variety of experiences and you're really knowledgeable of plants because you've worked at a nursery for a year and a half or whatever it was. Put that down. If you worked as a greenskeeper, you know, and uh, or a groundskeeper, so not even a greenskeeper, you just sort of was a guy who sat on the mower and was told what to do. You can say, I worked at a golf course for two years, right? And, oh, okay, he worked at a golf course for two years. Now he's been doing a lot of residential work, but you know, he's maintains a couple of bigger sites or she's maintains a couple of bigger sites. She's done some things. Write down whatever experience is relevant, right? When I first started out, luckily for me, I had a lot of experience working at schools. So I used that. Even though I had never 
at the start of my business, I'd never worked for a school as a part of my business. And I was honest about it. I'm not saying as a business that we we worked for this sort of school. No, I said I was I was an employee for this school at this place. I know what it's like to maintain larger sites. Sweet. Write that experience down. Every single person who's going to be there, write it down. This is important because some people, other businesses might do this, right? You might not be the only one doing it, but it does make people familiar and there's a level of trust with that. If you have other team members that are going to be on site, you can put them down too. But here's where the knockout punch is. The services. Write a detailed description of every single service that you are quoting for. This is huge. I cannot understate this enough, overstate this enough. Which way is it? I can't remember. Anyways, it's really important. (laughs) And the reason is that a lot of your competitors do not have the time. They do not care. They can't be bothered. And so they're going to say mowing 21 times a year, and that will cost you $30,000. Okay, what does mowing mean, right? If you're talking about a residential job, no questions asked. Everyone knows what mowing means. But here's how I quote it. I write every single service. I write a little heading and then I write a description. It might be one paragraph. It might be two paragraphs. Sometimes it's more because they need more explanation. Let me read out to you how I would describe a mowing service in a big contract like this. Mowing. All quoted mowing services include X areas be very specific with that if it's a complicated big site with lots and lots of different little lawns even though you might have talked about it 30 times it shows them that you are paying attention basically the last thing they want is somebody to quote 29 of the 30 lawns go through the whole thing and then realize they missed one and they have to change the price right you included all the areas so all, all mowing services include x areas the property will be mowed with rod on mowers clippings collected Edges maintained with both whipper snippers and bladed edges, parts blown down and waste removed from site. Obviously, you would, if it's not going to be done by a cylinder mower, oh, sorry, a rider mower, you wouldn't put it in. If you're going to use the cylinder, you'd put that in. If you know, you don't, yeah, you just describe what you're doing in detail. Things like both whipper snippers and bladed edges. You know, they might have had it in the past. People just whippy all the edges and. I know there's some of you out there who who do that and they do a fantastic job of of you know whippy edges. You know, no discredit to you at all. But we also know that so there's some council workers out there and all sorts of stuff who like their beveled edges or they like their just hacking into it. And so little things like that, you know, and when another company just says mowing 30 times a year, and you say it's gonna be using right on mowers, we're gonna edge it, we're gonna take the clipping toy, waste removed, it just it's just a bit. It's like when you go to a, a restaurant and they say hamburger, right? Or then another restaurant's like, you know, this is Angus beef with mustard from, you know, a goat's earlobe from the Himalayan, you know, whatever. You know, it's just like so descriptive of everything. And you're like, I don't even know what it means, but it sounds good. You know, that's essentially what you're trying to copy here. You're trying to be not over the top fancy like some of those restaurants can be but just being specific. And then here's another thing that I've done in this quote. So for the mowing, after I've explained everything that you heard, I've also written, we have quoted enough time for our team to carefully do all services on the property, not rushing around or cutting corners to come under certain target times. We will not mow before 8 a.m. unless external circumstances like weather or other issues prevent us from being able to complete our services. The reason why I've written that is I've made a fake scenario where, like I said before, you've asked those questions, why are you getting somebody else, you know, what, um, you know, why are you looking for us? Let's say they've said, well, the other business, they rush a lot and they're always here early in the morning and it's a retirement village and we like our sleep-ins. Obviously, retirement village people don't really, but you get the idea. I made up this scenario. Write it down. Put it in there. Don't just have the conversation. Go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's important. Keep it in your head. Write it down because then they go, oh, wow, this person listened. And that is so valuable. To have somebody who listens, man, they would have dealt with all the big boys. They're not doing this, right? And so, you know, we're back to the questions we gave two good examples before. Another thing you can do is, let's say you're at a retirement village. Say, are there any problem people or who are the problem people who always complain about gardening work? 
and what are their most common complaints, right? And let's say there's Aunt Margaret in the corner, you know, and she's always whinging about the guy is too fast. He's cutting too fast. And it's like, you're not cutting too fast, right? <clears throat> what I would do, honestly, <clears throat> I would quote an extra 10, 15 minutes. And I would tell everybody who worked for me if I was doing it myself, that number 14, when Aunt Margaret is in the corner, go so slow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just go slow, you know, quote extra time. And you don't know how valuable that, let's say you win the contract and you slow down like a snail around number 14 and she doesn't complain. And the facility manager hears that Aunt Margaret, after 75 years of whinging, is all of a sudden not complaining at the contractor, that facility manager would tell all their friends and you win more jobs, right? And that's just how it is. So. That's why you ask those specific questions. Who are the problem people? What are their issues, right? Uh, another great question, and we'll, we'll get to this <clears throat> with the next host we're going to talk about is, what common problems have you seen in the lawn, like with the quality of the lawn, right? Or, or are there issues that commonly scalp, right? Are there spots that always look bad? You know, uh, there's some areas that look good. What's causing them to look good? Like try and sort that sort of stuff out. There might be a dead patches that gets caused every single year or you realize is the sprinklers aren't quite reaching there or things like that, right? The other companies, they're not asking those questions. Often the time they're not. And so those little questions just show to the facility manager or the principal or whoever you're talking to, wow, this person, they really care about the job. Then you write them in. Or show you for lawn fertilization. Just finish my little drink there. So here's how I've written lawn fertilization as a second service. Now, I've only given two services as an example here, but I'll describe every single service we're doing. Pre-emergent, post-emergent, aeration, you know, wetting agents, reticulation checking, hedging, whatever. All right. Take another drink and I'll read this uh, fertilization. Here's what I've seen. This service includes all lawns to be fertilized with high quality lawn fertilizers designed to promote health, color, and resilience of the lawn. We do not cut corners on the application rate or on the quality of products to cut costs. I put that in, right? <laughs> like, because some people, we've had it before. I had a site, a retirement village, where somebody was like, they came to us and they're like, hey, look, this other person, they're quoting like, I don't remember what it was, but let's say $2,000 a year to fertilize lawns and you're quoting us, let's say $10,000 a year. Don't quote those numbers, but it was something like that, right? And they're like, why is yours so much more expensive? And I was like, $2,000 a year? And I just showed them. I literally got up a packet um, or like no, so the, the, the recommendation from the manufacturer. And I was like, this manufacturer says 30 grams per square meter. You have this many square meters. That means we need, let's say, 250 kilos per application, you know, five times a year. That's $4,000 just a product. Right. And they were like, oh, and we won that contract. I bet you what the other guy was doing is he was just getting some cheap fertilizer, chucking it down and at a, at a low rate, saying, yeah, I've done that. Wipes his hands of it. Right. But those little one percenters do it. So saying, oh, we don't cut corners, all that sort of stuff. You can be transparent with what products you're using. Right. Some people are like, oh, you know, they don't know the markup. They don't care. You know, if they do care, they're not the business you want to work for. The good ones don't care. They want you to make money. They just want to not worry about it, right? So they might be like, okay, what sort of products are you using? I'm interested. And you go, well, I'm using blah, 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 blah. You know? Uh, next part I've written, we believe that this over time will improve the quality of the lawns and the overall look of the property, especially in area X, which has been struggling. Remember what we said before, which areas have been struggling. So you would say, especially outside of number 42, which has always had that spot, that struggles, whatever right? You get the idea. You can write this out for every single service. It will take time. Now, you might say, I'm terrible at writing. I should have said this at the beginning because you know, I might have lost some of you. But if you're terrible at writing, there's this thing called chat GPT. You probably have heard of it. If you haven't, go look up some YouTube videos. It will do the writing for you. It's artificial intelligence. You give it some prompts and just write some bullet points. Say, Write me a service description. Um, I'm quoting a commercial facility 
I'm going to mow a lawn with a ride on lawnmower, include the edging, blah, blah, blah. It'll write out something for you. It'll sound good. Sweet. Put it in there. Make you, excuse me, make you look like a genius. Do that. Do that for every single service. You get the idea. Now, let's look at how we do the pricing. Scroll straight down. This is the next secret. I'm going to zoom out. I've laid this out in a way that looks somewhat pretty. How you lay it out, not that important as long as it looks somewhat pretty. All these numbers on here. Now, if you're listening, I've got um, sort of services, number of services a year, service costs and cost per year in a spreadsheet. And at the bottom, it's spitting out the total, the GST, all that sort of stuff. You can see it if you go on um, YouTube. I'll zoom in so those watching on YouTube can see the what it looks like. There you go. That's what it looks like. How it specifically looks is not the most important thing. What is crucial here, and another massive advantage, is always, and I cannot stress this enough, always give three options. Always give three options. Low, medium, high. Two reasons for it. One is the... uh, It's like when you go to the lotto and you buy three lotto tickets except for one. It's almost like cheating. You're not, you're not putting in one quote, right? You're putting in three. So they might have another business that, you know, I might have three businesses quoting and those other other businesses are only putting one quote in, right? You've given three options. You know, they're, they're really considering five different quotes then. Three of them are yours and two of them are the other people's. So there's that as well. But the other thing is that sometimes, and I've had this happen, believe me, I've quoted a facility. I remember this was actually the very first quote I ever did for a retirement village. And I told you about this at the beginning of the podcast, I believe. $50,000 a year or something like that with some add-ons. And I gave them three quotes just like this. And I thought they might accept the cheap one. They probably won't accept the middle one. They're definitely not going to accept the expensive one. But man, and I, th- I, I was thinking it was about 30, a 40, and a 50 grand quote. And you know what? They accepted the expensive one. And I was blown away. And I had that co- contract for three years. I lost it because the business needed to, or they wanted to get a company that could service the entire state, which was like 30 or something retirement villages. And I think I had two employees when they did that. So yeah, we weren't going to be able to do that. But sometimes what happens is a facility manager, they really want a high-end service, but they think it's going to be off the charts expensive. So they just don't really tell you. Give them that option. They probably won't accept it because I think that's the only time it's ever been accepted, the top one, but it has happened. Um, I told you before about an experience with BP, how they cut you down. That can happen too. Both, Both ends can happen. But when you only give yourself one option, you don't, Give yourself the option to do that high-end job. Give yourself three options. And the way I do it is option three is like, what would I want? What would Luke Smith want to do at this facility to make it look immaculate? And I do it. I'm like, it'll be weekly mowing through the growing season and fortnightly in winter. And we'll do this many fertilizations, by the way, with the number of services again on this spreadsheet that I've got here. I'm putting down, these are all fake, right? Like I'm not... I'm just giving you the context. So don't don't look at this and go, oh, Luke does 42 mowing services a year and 26 garden weed controls and eight fertilizers and it's it's irrelevant. It's not what I'm actually quoting. Don't base don't base your quote off that, right? But you get the idea. I'm giving three options. So the the expensive one is what do I really, really want? And what would make this place look amazing? The middle one is what do I think they're really asking for quality wise? And then the bottom one is um like, you know, what's the cheapest thing I can do and probably still hit most of their goals, if not all of their goals, right? And, you know, if you win, often, as you can expect, they go for the middle one. And if they go for the middle one, fantastic, you know, but you've given context for it. You've also showed that you're capable of doing a few different options. Again, it sets you apart from everybody else. Now, the last thing is references. 
if you don't have any experience, that's tough. But there is something you can do. Um, for those who are listening, we've just got a couple of pictures of work that we've done, you know, and, and the way that I basically do it is uh, I would just say, uh, I've, put, I've written here, John Johnson, CEO of Chicken Nugget Business. And then in brackets, I put reference, which is, you know, what John Johnson would say. And then at the bottom, I would say, we provide these services for that business, right? And just get the, the, the people who, if you are working for commercial places, ask them if they could please write a little reference and say one paragraph is fine. And um, tell them they can use chat GPT if they need to, as long as it comes from them. Right. You can put that down now. If you don't have any references, and this is, I've got to finish this up soon. Hopefully, you're finding this helpful. Um, here's what I would do: if you're quoting a strata, right, and you've asked those good questions, and write down six, seven, eight questions to ask, and make sure that you do ask them. <clears throat> I was in a meeting once. Back to the questions. I should have spent more time talking about this. Maybe, maybe a few other good ones will come up. But I was in a meeting once. And I had a quest. Um, we were there for like an hour and a half touring this facility. We didn't win this quote. Um, that were too cheap. But um, they sent us a thank you for our quote because the attention to detail we put into it and stuff. And they just said, look, you know, we were too expensive. That's fine. But I remember in this meeting, after an hour and a half, we talked about all these sorts of things. And they said, do you have any more questions? And um, <laughs> they were expect- they thought, uh, you know, it's just a normal question, but, you know, they're not expecting a real answer. And I was like, yeah, I actually do. And I opened up a little notepad and I had like three questions that we hadn't talked about. You know, like, what are your payment terms or what is this or what is that? And I can't remember what the questions were, but they were like, oh, my goodness, this guy is thorough, <laughs> you know. And again, you know, like I said, they they really appreciated our quote and they sent us a thank you for the time and everything. And that was, you know. Those things work. So with the references, let's say you don't have any references that are actually in the commercial scene. If you're a t- if you're doing like a retirement village, a small retirement village, 20, 30 little houses, do you know what you can do? How many elderly clients do you have in that same age bracket? And be honest. Don't pretend you're bigger than what you are. They'll see straight through it. These facility managers are not dumb. But if you have a couple of elderly people who are lovely old men and women who would love to support you, go to them and say, hey, um, Mrs. Jones, I'm quoting this retirement village and there's about 20 people there. And um, well, could you please write a little reference for me for, uh, you know, just to say that I'm you know, trustworthy, I'm not scary, I come when I say I will, all that sort of stuff. That still has value. It honestly does. Now, again, if that person, that facility manager is sick of the big boys and what their number one thing is, is the other people that rush around and this and that, whatever, a a nice little reference from a little old lady will go a long way. So don't feel like, oh, I've never done this before, so I'm not going to win it. You know, no one's going to accept me. You actually have a great opportunity for that to happen. So let me go through this whole process again. Usually my documents, I think this page, how many is it? This is five pages. Usually my quotes are seven or eight pages because the description for the actual, uh, there's a lot more services that we're describing. But you get the idea. We start with a nice cover page with photos. Get someone to take photos of you if you don't have them already. If you have some money, invest it into a photographer the more or the better quality of the photos, the higher is of a standard it puts <clears throat> puts you. Um, you know, just lay it out nice. Use Canva for that. You don't have to copy this exactly. A little letter at the front and your whole quote, everything you write is really just about saying, I listened. When I was on site and we talked, write notes, ask good questions, say I listened. You write your little letter explaining it, put your signature in there, right? Um also, also, just a little note is if you, if you don't, if you're going to print this and email this, you can use an app to scribble your signature on your phone. Use it as an image. That's just a little thing for you. If you're wondering how do I get my signature onto a Word document, YouTube it. There'll be plenty of YouTube videos on it. Little pictures about your team, but then the real hard hitting stuff 
is listening, doing the one percenters and describing exactly what you're quoting because your competition who do not care so much about these big quotes or who are not as professional, who is not as careful as you, they're not going to go to the detail that you will go to. Right, you are going to say things like, "This is very specifically what we're doing. This is exactly how we're going about it." Right, we don't cut corners on this. We're not going to rush around. And you're just saying, "I listened. I listened. I listened." I've got a nice little photo at the bottom here. Any space you have, I often like have each page for services. So, if I run out of text, I've got half a page left. Chuck in a nice picture there if you have one. Quotes always give three prices, three levels to your service. It just it sets you apart in terms of, um, you know, again, attention to detail, giving options, and it's just a numbers game. It puts three of your bids into the rest of them. And then references at the bottom, like I said before, if you have no commercial references, then, you know, people who are relevant, uh, you know, like I said, you're not going to go from only residential work to private schools. Right. And I'll just say as well, if you're watching this, these genuinely are photos. Like every photo on this is stuff we've done. So you can see that school oval. Hopefully it comes up. It's it's striped. It's real nice. Right. That's a beautiful school oval. That's a weapon. If you don't have those photos, <clears throat> it's gonna be harder to win it. So, you know, obviously great photos of a beautiful school oval or a nicely mulch. That's a school car park. Yeah, I just chucked in. That's probably not as nice. But you know, I was just chucking things in together to show you but um, if you have great photos of lawns you've done even if it's residential and you're standing doing a push mower <clears throat> put it in there be honest about the size of the business you are they're going to know it they're going to see through it if you're trying to lie and manipulate and say well they're massive you know so i've heard about businesses who create fake email accounts <laughs> like like you know you have your website so we have silverstonegardening.com.au, right? And my, you know, <clears throat> I might put in a, 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 an email that says, you know, uh, I've got to think about people who haven't worked for me. Uh, let's say Diane at silverstonegardening.com.au because no one's, I've never hired anyone called Diane. I could make that email and have it divert to my email and just reply as, as if I'm Diane. I've heard about people doing that. Dumb move. Right, because someday that's going to get caught. <laughs> just, just be honest. Hey, it's just me and old mate Tim over there. He's my offsider. That's all we are, right? And if they don't like it, there's nothing you can do about it. The last thing you want to do is to mislead them. They sign the contract and then they find it's just you and Tim six months later. Well, how can they trust you now, right? You want to be honest. You want to be transparent. You want to have integrity. Because they're the one percenters. All right. So hopefully you learned something from that. That's a long podcast (laughs) for me to just waffle on. Now, again, I started to say the start of the podcast. I don't know how many people are still listening to this. Probably not many. But if you are listening to it, you probably found a hell of a lot of value out of it. If you did, we have a Patreon account. I would appreciate all the support that we can get. If you have no money and you cannot support us whatsoever, totally understand that, but share the podcast. If you have some friends also in the industry, share it out there. Um, We need all the support we can get. If there's another podcast that you think other friends might be interested in on lawn care or fertilizer or whatever, hedge trimming, share those ones that may be a little bit more, have a broader reach. But that's that. If you have it, if there's anything I missed, um, we are going to do a podcast with somebody who's got a lot of experience with tenders, probably in a couple of weeks, maybe to a month, something like that. Somebody here in WA, super great guy. So if you've got questions, we, we might be able to visit them in a couple of weeks. So comment on the YouTube videos, on the social media posts I put up about this podcast, comment there. Uh, that's probably the best place to do it. You know, don't send me any any messages with questions because I, I find them harder to find. They get lost in the message heap. But if you comment on those things, I can look back, back at them in a couple of weeks and aggregate them all there. Thanks for your support. Again, jump on Patreon. It actually does make a big difference. Um, you can tell the amount of time that this is going to take. This is got, it's, it's now, you know, it's well after 9 o'clock at night and I need to edit this and send this out. So I'll wrap this up right now. Thanks for listening. See you in the next pod.